it's Mother's Day, a time to celebrate all the wonderful mothers out there, not just for being shining examples of how great a mom can be, but also for being beautiful reflections of who God is. Like God, you've provided for us. You've shown us how much you care from the very beginning. With God, you've guided us, helping us navigate through every decision, big or small. You've been patient with us, helping us grow and learn from the mistakes we make. And like God, you forgive us, offering us grace so those mistakes can never define us. You've been present, sounds so simple, but it's so important just knowing you're there when we need you. And most of all, you've loved us unconditionally as only someone filled with God's love could. So today we thank you, moms, for all of this and so much more. Happy Mother's Day. Hi, and welcome to Fort Alliance Online. Thank you so much for choosing to join us today. We're really glad that you're here. A couple of things that we wanted to highlight today before we get started in our service. One of them is our MailChimp. It's a weekly newsletter that we send out with a lot of news and upcoming events, uh, information that we think is valuable for you to know. Just a really great way to connect and communicate here at Fort Alliance. And so if you haven't signed up for that already, it's really easy. Just go to fortsaskalliance.com hit the about tab and hit weekly newsletter and then just pop your email address in and you're subscribed then to our weekly updates that way. You can unsubscribe at any time. If you've already done that, uh, awesome. You're already in the know and we just, uh, we thank you for taking that step as it really is one of the best ways to stay in touch here at Fort Alliance. So thank you for doing that. Another thing that we would like to touch on today is just how thankful we are uh, with the giving and the gifts that you have been able to uh, bless us with as a church. We really do appreciate that. Because of that, we've been able to minister to a lot of people in Fort Saskatchewan and we're really thankful to be able to do that. And of course, we'd love to continue to do that. If you'd like to give and you're not doing that already and you're wondering how you can do that, there are a couple ways. Uh, one is you can pop into the church building during office hours and you can use our credit debit machine. You can also give online. So if you just go to fortsasklines.com, uh, you can go to the giving tab or there's a big banner on our homepage that says, thank you for your giving. And you can uh, just sign up in that way. If, if you need a little bit of assistance, you can always give Pam in the office a call and she would be more than happy to walk you through uh, the steps and give you whatever kind of assistance that you need to set that up. And again, we just really thank you for that. We really value your giving and we just would really love to be able to keep on ministering the way we have been able to. So again, thank you for joining us. We're so glad you're here. We're really excited for the service. So let's get started. Friends, we're excited uh, to dive back into 1 John today. Uh, so grab a copy of God's Word and join me. We're going to be going into 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. If you do not have your own Bible, we would love to gift you a copy so you can swing by the church and we would love to give you a copy of God's Word. You can also uh, download the YouVersion app and have a copy of the Bible in many different versions uh, available for free on your phone. So we encourage you to do that. So 1 John, right near the end of the Bible here, chapter 4, starting in verse 7, and we're going to be reading to verse 11. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into this world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to look into your word today. 
as we talk about what it means to love each other, what your love for us means, God, I pray that you would be pouring that love into our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here we are once again. John is talking about how we need to love each other. So we've been going through 1 John for the past, I would say, few months at this point. We've had a couple breaks for Easter and whatnot. Uh, But in these four short chapters that we've covered already, John has already talked about loving each other at least six times. Can you imagine receiving this letter You might be like, okay, John, we get it. You want us to love each other. Do you have anything else to say? Or are you just trying to hit your word count here? Word counts are really on my mind. I've been writing a lot of papers lately. It's important to hit your word count. And you can just imagine John's response saying, no, you clearly don't get what I mean. Your behavior makes that obvious. You really have to love each other. To be honest, I felt this way sitting down to write this message. Pastor Ken uh, makes up the preaching schedule, and so I go and I check and look to see what I'm preaching on, and I'm like, another sermon on loving each other? What else is there for me to say? I I feel like I've tapped this. But if the past two and a half years have shown us anything, it's that we obviously don't have this practice of loving each other uh, down pat. Now, if you spent some time reading the Bible, you'll know that even though it's a long book, it's a thick book, it isn't necessarily a wordy book, except for maybe the genealogies. Those can get quite wordy. But there's lots of subjects uh, in the Bible where I'm reading them and I think, man, I would love if you would have just written a little bit more about that, if you would just expand on that a bit. So the Bible isn't unnecessarily wordy. So the fact that John is hammering home, uh, love each other, love each other, God is love, love each other, it's important and it should make us sit up and, and pay attention. So our passage starts out with John saying, dear friends, let us love one another. And he goes on to give us another reason why we should love each other. And he says, it's because love comes from God. He then goes on to say, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. It's a phrase we hear a lot, right? But I wonder if we can actually really articulate what that means. What does it mean that God is love? Does that mean God's fuzzy feelings? God is feeling good or nice? God's butterflies in your stomach. I think we need to figure out what we mean when we say, I think to figure out what we mean when we say God is love, we need to first ask the question, well, what is love? So much of what we see in scripture and talk about in the church on Sundays and in our Bible studies and in our personal devotions is about love, right? Our love for God, God's love for us, our love for others. Love is such a vital concept for us that we really need to get it figured out. And I think we hear it so often and we say it so much that sometimes it can be like, yeah, love, love, but we really need to get a hold of what that means. So we're going to dive into that just a little bit right now. C.S. Lewis, I'm not going to read Chronicles of Narnia today, don't worry. C.S. Lewis writes a book called The Four Loves in which he distinguishes between uh, the four ancient Greek words that are used for love in the Bible. There's eros, philos, storge, and agape. And these are all words that we translate as love. Now, it's important for us to explore the different Greek words for love that we see in the New Testament because we all experience all of the kinds of love that I just listed. But we know, we sense that our love for God is supposed to be unique and different. And we know that his love for us must mean more than what we say when we say, ah, we love that thing. And so that's why it can be helpful to categorize and clarify these different loves that we experience. So let's briefly discuss discuss each one of the the loves that I just mentioned. So first we have eros. It's a kind of romantic love where the lovers desire each other. And then we have philos, which is friendship love, where, as I read earlier this week, two people are linked arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, with a common vision and a common goal and a delight and a partnership pulling together toward the goal. It's friendship love. 
And then there's storge, which is familial love, so love that you feel for your kids or you feel for your parents or your aunts and your uncles. And then we have agape, which is divine love, which is characterized by sacrifice in the pursuit of the good of another person. So it's important to note for our purposes today that in the passage that we just read, every time we read the word love, in our passage, the Greek word there is actually agape. Love characterized by sacrifice in the pursuit of another person's good. So obviously, the love of God is the agape brand, and we're going to come back to that in a little bit. But first, I want to move on, and I want to talk about Jonathan Edwards. He's an old-timey guy, had lots of good things to say, lots of hard things to say. Uh, And how he divided the idea of love was into two categories, the love of complacency and the love of benevolence. First, I have to define here what I mean, what he meant by complacency, because as we know, words change. And so complacency, what he meant by it, is not what we think of it today. So what we think of complacency is to be smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. But that's not what he meant by it. What it meant back then, it had to do with a sense of pleasure, And now not pleasure as in sensual or erotic or romantic pleasure, but rather a delight in that which is supremely pleasing to the soul. The roots of the meaning of complacency in the Oxford English Dictionary are traced back with the primary meaning given as the fact or state of being pleased with a thing or person, tranquil pleasure or satisfaction in something or someone. So, love of complacency, for example, would be me saying, I love Miller's ice cream. I am pleased by the qualities present in Miller's ice cream. It's delicious taste, it's charming locale, it's community-minded business practices, and it's adorable merchandise. I've been hinting for a Miller's ice cream sweater for quite some time from my husband, and I might just have to go buy my own. But that would be love of complacency. You might love a place, a country, a sport, a sports team. It's something that you love because it or they are lovely. They are pleasing to you. And a love of complacency isn't negative. It's not bad. We should be loving God with a love of complacency because he is good and he is lovely and he is wonderful. But then we move on to the love of benevolence. I've seen it put this way. The love of benevolence, it's not based on the attractiveness of the object of your love, but rather your benevolence, your goodwill toward the person or thing that you are loving. Your aim in that kind of love is to do good, to bring about something beautiful, not to just respond to beauty. The love of benevolence is the quality of goodwill towards others. The Bible talks often of God's benevolence and goodwill towards us. As we see in verse 9 of our passage today, John says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world that we might live through him. God is benevolent. So to recap, God's love for us is agape, in that it is divine love characterized by sacrifice in the pursuit of another person's good. And it is a benevolent love, as in he loves us not because we are lovely, but because he is kind, because he is benevolent. So remember the week before last, I talked about John's appeal for us to love not just in word, but also in deed and action. And we see this again here in verse 9, a perfect example of God's love being made manifest among us by God sending his only son to the world so that we might live through him. God didn't just talk about loving, he loved in the ultimate action of dying for us. This, friends, is the defining sign of agape, self-sacrifice. Now when we think of self-sacrifice, I tend to think of some pretty dramatic stuff, right? Taking a bullet for someone, running into a burning building to save them, dying on a cross for them. And these are 100% fantastic examples of sacrificial love. Jesus' death on the cross is the ultimate example of sacrificial love. Greater love has no man than he who lays down his life for his friends. But sacrificial love isn't always so grandiose, so life-shifting. Sometimes it's small, 
And because it can be small, we can convince ourselves that it doesn't matter. But we are called to agape in the small day-to-day areas of our lives. And we'll talk about that again in a little bit. So back to our text, verse 10. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus paid it all. Now, the version that I just read uh, you, that I just read from for you uh, is the NIV, and it says atoning sacrifice. Some versions say propitiation. That's a, you know, a big theological word, but it's a pretty important word, so we're going to talk about it a little bit right now. Atoning sacrifice, propitiation. It includes six concepts all rolled into one. God's holiness, God's wrath, God's justice, God's mercy, God's love, and God's grace. Dr. David Allen says, when Christ died on the cross, all six of these converged. God's holiness demonstrates the sinfulness of sin. God's wrath against sin was poured out on Christ on the cross. God's justice was satisfied on the cross. God's mercy towards sinners was demonstrated at the cross. God's love for the world was demonstrated at the cross, John 3, 16. And God's grace was demonstrated at the cross because he gives us what we don't deserve. He's benevolent. So in Jesus, we have freedom from our sins and access to new life. And friend, that is good news. If you would like to know more about that good news, more about what it means to know Jesus, to have him be the payment for your sins, to come into your life, to bring you freedom and peace and joy, we would love to talk with you more about that you can contact us through our website and we would just be so happy to set up a time to meet to talk to you more about Jesus. So our passage today wraps up with yet another admonition from John to love each other. Again, dear friends, verse 11, since since God is love, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So we've talked about the love that is being discussed here, right? Agape, love, self-sacrifice, self-sacrificing love. So what does agape look like on Mother's Day? We're gonna celebrate that this Sunday. Well, I'm glad you asked. Maybe you're thinking, you know, send your mom a card, buy her some flowers, thank her and compliment her and do manual labor because agape is self-sacrificing, right? All these things can be very lovely on Mother's Day, and I do actually have a lot of manual labor that I would like done outside of my home this Mother's Day. But I want today to take it to a bit of a deeper place and talk about what agape can look like in the church on Mother's Day. This day can be an extremely stressful day for a lot of women and for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it can feel like this day is intentionally designed to throw what you don't have or what you don't even want just in your face. Now, I'm not dissing Mother's Day. Hear me say that. Mothers are so vitally important. And it is lovely to take time to celebrate all of the women who mother in a variety of ways. And you know, I'm delighted at the opportunity of another opportunity to get a gift, right? I never say no to that. But like I said, it can be a hard, hard day. And unfortunately in the church, we can tend sometimes to make it even harder. I've seen women in this very church weep on Mother's Day because of the questions that they've been asked and the comments that they've heard. Now before I continue, I wanna give the disclaimer and say that in a lot of these situations, I would say most of them, no harm is intended. People mean well. They don't realize that their comments and questions are hurtful. But that doesn't change the fact that they are. So I want to encourage us, myself included, on this Mother's Day, before we ask a question or make a comment to a woman, let's take a moment and ask ourselves a few questions first. Let's ask ourselves, is there any way that what I'm about to say can trigger something hurtful and painful for the person that I'm about to ask it to? Ask, we need to ask ourselves, why am I asking this question even? Do I need to know this information? Do I have a close enough relationship with this person to warrant asking a question of this nature? 
is this information my concern? Now, I'm gonna be honest, I hesitated bringing this up today because I didn't want to offend anybody. But I ran it by several women that I know, and the unanimous answer from these women who have no children, small children, teenage children, one child, many children, was yes, <laughs> please address this. So today, when you're talking to a married couple with no children, and in your mind you're wondering, when are they gonna have children? Or why don't they have children yet? Or do they wanna have children? Take a moment and remember that that question could potentially be damaging and painful for, the per for that person or for those people. Today, when you're talking to a single woman, don't ask her if there are any special men in her life or when she plans to get married or if she knows that her biological clock is ticking. These are real life examples, friends. Today, when you're talking to a woman who already has children, don't ask her when she's gonna have more. You don't know that yesterday she didn't just have a miscarriage and her heart is broken. You don't know that last week she didn't just hear from her doctor that she's unlikely to be able to have any more children and she's grieving that. You don't know that maybe she feels like her family is complete the way that it is. You don't know that maybe she would like to have more children, but she doesn't feel like she can afford them or, or like she can handle them emotionally or, or mentally and that she's feeling guilty about that. And I beg of you, in no situation whatsoever, please do not ask a woman if she's pregnant. I don't care if you think you see a baby bump. I don't care if she just mentioned that she doesn't feel good. I don't care if that she just touched her stomach. If you aren't close enough to have been told that she's pregnant, it's in no way appropriate for you to ask. If someone is pregnant and they want us to know, they'll tell us when they're ready. If you see a woman who doesn't have a child holding a baby, please don't say, oh, that looks good on you. If you're talking to your friends who have adult children, don't ask them when they're gonna have grandbabies. They probably want those grandbabies. They know. Celebrate the mothers that God has brought into your life. And let's just leave it at that. Now you might feel annoyed by some of the things that I just said. You might feel offended. You might think, well, people are just too sensitive. Or I wasn't being rude. Kids are a gift from the Lord and that's why I'm inquiring. I just want that blessing for them. But again, it doesn't matter that we don't mean harm. It's good that we don't mean harm, but regardless of intention, if behavior is hurtful, we need to adjust it. And friends, this is one way that we can make the church a welcoming and safe place, rather than a place that women avoid on days like Mother's Day. Family's complicated, mothering is complicated. These ideas and concepts can be painful, they can be so tied up with identity. And please, we need to remember that we don't ever fully know what is going on with someone, what they're going through. We don't know if they're estranged from their mother or their grandmother or their child. We don't know if they desperately want kids but just can't find a life partner. If you know someone today who is struggling with infertility, check in with them. Just let them know that you love them and that you see them. Let them know that they are seen. Instead of questions, let's try a positive word. To that mother, you're doing great. I'm proud of you. Jesus loves you. You're beloved by the Father. I also want to encourage you to thank the women in your lives who maybe haven't birthed a child, but still play a mothering role. There are so many people in my daughter's life who are not her biological mother, but who mother her. I'm so grateful for them. There are many kids that I didn't give birth to, but I choose to mother and love. I can think of so many women who haven't had their own biological children, and yet they play vital and protective roles in the lives of so many children. Take a minute today and thank them for that. Maybe today, as you celebrate Mother's Day, it's a day of happiness and joy and excitement for you. And if that's the case, I genuinely am so thankful for that. But please remember that for so many, it's a complicated day. It's a day that can be fain, filled with both pain and joy. Or maybe it's a day that's just filled with layers and layers and layers of sorrow and anger. Just remember that everyone that you approach today doesn't necessarily approach this day in the same way that you do. The church needs to be a place where people are extra careful to be loving, to be agape with their speech. 
Now, if I said that and your automatic reaction was, people are just too sensitive to these days, or today's culture is just so ridiculous, I just I always have to tiptoe around people, not to hurt their feelings. My response to you is, yeah, that's sacrificial love. Thinking about others instead of ourselves. Instead of gratifying our curiosity or whatever it is, we stop and we think about what's best for that other person, the way that we can best support them, best pray for them. What would make them feel the most comfortable, the most loved, the most cared for, and the most seen? The children of God should be taking time to reflect and introspect about their interactions with others, and the church should be the safest emotional place for those who are hurting, frustrated, and confused on Mother's Day and on every other difficult, joyous, and complicated day. Agape is a sacrificial love that voluntarily suffers inconvenience, discomfort, and even death for the benefit of another without expecting anything in return. We are called to agape through Christ's example. And I'm going to end by reading Ephesians 5, 1 to 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Friends, my prayer for us today is that we would be able to take a moment and to, to ask the Holy Spirit to speak through us that we would be able to take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit to edit our words, to make us ministers of mercy and peace. And my prayer for you today, friend, if you're hearing this and you're grieving and Mother's Day feels like just the most horrible day in the world, that you know that Jesus loves you and that we love you. Thanks for joining us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you would pour your love unto everyone watching this. Lord, that you would soothe hearts, that you would soothe minds, that you would soothe souls and spirits. We love you, Jesus. And I pray that this Mother's Day, that we would be able to celebrate the gift of mothers, the gift of motherhood. Lord, mothers are so important. We pray that you would bless them. Lord, and I pray for those who are grieving and who are hurting that you would go to them, that you would wrap them in your arms, that you would give them your love and your comfort. In Jesus' name, amen.
See? 